Okay, thanks everyone for coming. Um, this is the defense for uh, Miranda Ratson. Come step over here so the camera oh, can see you. Um, so Miranda came to us from the University of Delaware, uh, where she did a degree in wildlife. What's the degree in conservation? Wildlife conservation and ecology. Um, and she came here to do a master's project working with uh, white-tailed deer as well as bobcats. The bobcat part kind of tanked. Uh, despite our best efforts, neither of us were able to catch her any bobcats. I caught one. We caught one, but that's that's a part of deep personal shame for me. <laughs> um, but uh, incredibly proud of Miranda and what she has accomplished. We honestly could not have done this project without her. Um, her expertise in animal capture and handling was just absolutely vital in being able to come in and take hold of this project and really run it from day one to where we didn't have to be out there training her. And so this really is her work um, and what she did. So I'm really excited for her to share that with you. So I'll turn the time over to her. Okay. Um, so here I say thank you, but I'll say thank you again. Uh, thanks for everyone coming out. This is gonna, I'm gonna try and keep it as short as possible, but we might dip into that 35 minutes, so bear with me. Um, but so I'm going to be talking about the influences of habitat fragmentation and agriculture on white-tailed deer ecology, essentially. There's going to be two different chapters for my presentation. Um, before I get started into my actual work, um, I just wanted to acknowledge all of our funders and our support. We had a lot of um, uh, text and a lot of support for this project, and without them, this wouldn't have been able to get accomplished. And then my entire study area is completely privately owned. So without their um, need to part without their participation, I wouldn't have caught a single deer or had a single data point. So they deserve a big thank you as well. And then as well, uh, deer capture is very difficult for those of you who came out with me and didn't catch anything, for those of you who caught six of me. So um, I'd like to thank everybody who came out with me and then like all the support from well, and then um, quick shout out to my field dog right there. <laughs> he helped a lot. <laughs> um, so basically what we're looking at is the impacts that agriculture uh, has on uh, wildlife movement and habitat selection. And there could be a lot of factors playing into this and how we're actually utilizing these habitat types specifically. And a lot of this has to do with the uh, variability or um, fluctuation in this landscape going from our non-growing to or growing from our growing season to our non-growing season and then those big agricultural practices of harvesting and planting. So these deer need to adapt to those major changes on this landscape and the real question is how are they um, changing their movement or habitat selection to account for this large variability on the landscape. So for the rest of the presentation I'm going to be talking about two different seasons, and we're going to be talking about the growing as well as the non-growing season. So for the growing season, we see that there's ample cover on the landscape. We see a lot of resources in um, forage on this landscape during this growing time. And then also this could be acting as some sort of connectivity towards our more naturally occurring habitat patches throughout this agricultural matrix. So these crops could be acting as connectivity between our patches that are within this matrix. And then when we move to this non-growing season, there's a lot of disturbance on the landscape for a brief moment of time. Usually harvest occurs for two to four weeks, sometimes more, depending on weather conditions. But we see a very, very large shift in the uh, how this configuration of this landscape is. We're seeing all of that cover from those crops being taken off of this landscape, and a lot of the forage is being reduced drastically during this time. And during this time again, after this occurs, we're ending those winter months where this is going to be the hardest for most of our wildlife species. This is going to be the time crunch of where forage availability is limited, and we're also, with this landscape, we're get, getting rid of about 80% in, dom in agriculturally dominated landscapes through these harvesting practices. So what does this mean specifically for white-tailed deer? How are they adapting to what is happening on this landscape? So we can go into this in two different parts. So we see density dependence arise um, as an issue when these crops are harvested. We're seeing uh, potential to see overabundance in some of these more naturally occurring habitat types, patches, throughout that agricultural matrix when we're getting rid of a lot of that um, cover for crops. And then this could also um, 
result in habitat alteration with plant communities, and then also reduction, again, in less available forage if we're seeing overabundance in these more naturally occurring habitat types. And then another big one is disease transmission. Um, so if we're seeing overabundance or large uh, estimate, estimated densities of deer in these areas, this could be easier transmission of disease if there were an outbreak to uh, occur. And CWD is kind of one of those big diseases that's kind of up and coming in wildlife research and how this impacts populations specifically. So if we're seeing this crunch of overabundance in these naturally occurring habitats, if an outbreak of CWD were to occur, we could see easy transmission through these animals if they're condensed and packed in an area. And then as well as increased human wildlife conflict, um, crop damage in that summertime, uh, the edges of these more naturally occurring habitats, if there's a lot of deer in those areas, that's going to be high crop damage, as well as vehicle collisions. Um, a lot of roads are being used in agriculturally dominant landscapes, and this could increase the amount of vehicle collisions um, and, and entail increased human wildlife conflict. So our study area was kind of perfect for this, uh, for this specific research. So it's dominated by row crop agriculture. About 80% of this, of my study area is agriculture with the number one crop being corn, followed by soybeans and then alfalfa. And then we have um, some more naturally occurring habitat types that are kind of just laid about in this agricultural matrix. But the biggest one is that runs along the northern edge of the study area, which is that Platte River Valley. Um, and these are going to be more dedicated to like woody wetlands, cottonwoods, red cedars, willows, um, and that's probably going to be the largest patch in this area of kind of continuous naturally occurring um, habitat from the agriculture. And then other land cover types that we have kind of thrown throughout here are forests and then developed, which are more homesteads or housing. And um, what I kind of want to point out on this map, the green is going to be our agriculture. So you can see that a very, the vast majority of this area is dedicated to row crop agriculture. So to start kind of answering these questions of how these animals are using this habitat, um, we started to kind of think about how our de densities are uh, fluctuating between these naturally occurring and cultivated kind of areas within this, uh, within the study area. So we were going to try and tackle this issue using camera sampling data. So um, our objectives for this chapter of uh, my thesis research was to estimate these deer densities within the cultivated habitat types and the non-cultivated habitat types, and then determine if there's any seasonal differences between how these animals are utilizing these two different habitat types. So uh, we placed randomly placed cameras throughout the study area and we separated it into cultivated, which is shown in the darker gray, and then non-cultivated, which is shown in um, our lighter gray colors. So we placed cameras throughout this landscape randomly, um, and our pink cameras are going to be our cultivated, and then our orange cameras are going to indicate a non-cultivated camera lo sampling location. So we had to determine our sampling period. And we wanted to do this absence of any outside pressures, uh, so to make sure that we're seeing how these animals are actually utilizing this landscape without pressures um, on them outside of just these seasonal changes. So we looked at uh, the growing season from early July. This is kind of after that partrition period or their fawning period, and um, also when we kind of estimated corn growth to be high enough for a deer to pass through completely covered through the end of August, uh, our start of the hunting season. And then again, the non growing season, we have the end of hunting season, give or take a few days to let them adjust to remove those added pressures. And then finally ended in March for the non growing season. So for our cameras, we put out 27 uh, Bushnell trophy cams, and they were taking images uh, every three seconds. So if an animal passed by, the camera would motion detect it, and then it would wait three seconds to then motion detect another observation or another animal walking by. And then they did this with a burst of three images every time. And then we placed cameras roughly about 1.5 meters on a fence or a tree post because we thought that this would give the greatest vantage point to see a deer. So then we had to do camera place placement to make sure that these cameras were representative of these two habitat types. 
Um, we wanted to make sure that they were representing these habitat types. And what we did was we buffered <coughs> each camera location by the average home range size of white-tailed deer. And this average home range size we got from our collared or GPS tag animals in the area. And then if we had a greater than 50% cultivated land, it was dedicated as a cultivated land camera. So to give you kind of an example of what we did, so we buffered this by 1.6. This is our camera location. We buffered by 1.6 kilometers squared. Again, average home range size of the deer. And then our um, orange is going to be our non-cultivated area. So as you can guess, this is a non-cultivated camera. And then when we move into our uh, cultivated, green is going to represent cultivated. So you can see that this camera is pretty representative of a cultivated area. So for um, the methods, we did point count analyses in for um, both seasons and habitat types. So essentially, we ran four analyses for to account for those differences and to estimate densities within those areas. And we did this all using distance, uh, the distance package in program R. So to kind of walk you through what distance sampling is, it's pretty common when we're doing bird point count surveys. Um, so you're standing, standing at a location. So think of yourself standing at that green dot. And there's observations occurring all around you. So when you hear those observations or see that observation, you make a distance marker to where that's occurring. And this is how we can estimate those densities or abundances of populations in this area. And so what we did was we took a modification of this, um, which is in a paper by Howe et al. 2017. So obviously our camera is now our point, our sampling point. And so we can only see one chunk of that 360 view. So what this modification is doing is uh, basically taking that and replicating what's happening in front of the camera here is happening 360, and that's how we're modifying for only seeing a chunk of that 360 view. And from there, again, we take distances to where that animal is in front of that camera, and how we estimate those densities is through detection probability. So if we're close to the camera, we have a high detection probability, and it decreases as we go through, and this is how we get those estimations of our populations. So to get into the results, um, I broke this down into our growing and then our non-growing, as well as cultivated and non-cultivated. And um, as you can see, we had some differences in our cameras. And that's just because um, cameras fail sometimes. And then also we had a lot of difficulty within this cultivated area of uh, getting permission. So that kind of restricted those camera placements as well. Um, but I want to kind of focus in on this is our observations per camera per 10 days, and we see for that cultivated uh, habitat type, we go from about 7.39 per 10 days into less than one every 10 days. So there's a pretty pretty steep decline in the amount of deer that we're seeing in these areas just off of observations alone. So then when we get into the results of this camera sampling and estimating these densities of these deer, um, we see that the densities in the cultivated and non-cultivated section, these were our significant findings. Um, our confidence intervals didn't overlap. And uh, going from the cultivated and non-cultivated, even during the growing season, we see a high jump. And then I'd also just like to point out when we go from the growing season to the non-growing season, we see a jump in the density estimates in those non-cultivated areas. Um, and then another significant finding is while we saw a decline in our cultivated section during that non-growing time, Again, we saw increases in density estimates during this non-growing season. And this kind of makes it a little bit more clear. Um, so focusing on this red box during that non-growing season, uh, we're seeing significant differences between cultivated and non-cultivated uh, habitat types between those two density estimates. And then, um, unfortunately, we didn't see significant, uh, our confidence intervals are overlapping here, so unfortunately that's not significant. Uh, but we want to just focus on this red box here and showing that there is a very large decline in the amount of deer densities within these cultivated habitat types. So to kind of bring this all together, we're seeing a redistribution of deer during this non-growing season. Again, this is our winter time. Um, this is our harshest kind of season, so it could be moving to kind of um, play into what's happening on the landscape. And then again, densities were highest in both seasons within the non-cultivated habitat types. Um, and then densities decreased drastically within the cultivated habitat types. So 
So kind of to take this back, and what does this mean um, for these deer? They might be seeking refuge following this harvest since we're getting rid of a lot of that cover, ample forage. They're moving into those more naturally occurring, non-cultivated habitats to seek out resources that are lost with this um, harvest practice that's uh, happening. Encounter rates decrease substantially within both areas. Um, so I thought that was kind of odd. So I looked at that again and from like some of our GPS locations and uh, there could be an increase in movement. So that's why we saw about 1,800 observations during the growing season. And then when we moved into the non-growing season, we only had about 800 encounters of our cameras. Um, and these cameras were placed in the same exact location in the growing and non-growing season. So increased movement um, due to that loss in forage, loss in cover could have made it so these, these animals weren't passing by the camera as frequently, so we got less detection rates. Um, so what could help tighten up these confidence intervals or get more precise estimations of our densities of these deer would be increasing that camera surveying. So this was only done for one non-growing season and one growing season. So increasing that to multiple years might help with more observations, tighten up confidence intervals and give us more precise estimates of what's happening. And then another downfall is the private lands. Um, some areas we were not allowed to survey. So we might be missing some of these key areas of where deer might be in higher densities, but we just can't see that. So land ownership is kind of playing, uh, playing against us in this sense. So maybe to counteract that, putting more cameras out in places that we have access to. Sorry. Um, okay, so we're obviously seeing something happening with estimating these densities. We're seeing them go uh, go from this cultivated landscape drastically, um, reducing their use of this cultivated landscape during the non-growing season. So now we can kind of start tackling habitat selection issues using finer scale data um, off of our female GPS collared deer. So the objectives of uh, my second chapter of my thesis were to see how their habitat selection is changing between the growing and non-growing season. And we wanted to do this at the population level, which is a uh, second order selection. And so we had to uh, try and spread out our capture locations um, to try and get animals utilizing different areas of this study area. Excuse me. Um, so our red circles are indicating trap locations. So we tried to spread it out within this cultivated landscape and non-cultivated, um, as well as trying to spread it out as far south as we could. Unfortunately, those uh, these trap locations, we put efforts into these areas but didn't catch any deer. Um, there were, we saw sign of deer, but they were very far and few between, so they were difficult to catch and maybe not even there at the time that we wanted to capture them. So, um, unfortunately, we didn't get any deer in this area. So, for our animal capture, we uh, fixed our female, adult female deer with GPS collars that were taking one location for for every 24 for every hour of the day. So it was a 24-hour fix rate, and we um, captured our deer using drop nets and clover traps. We had a lot more success with drop nets, but we did use both um, means of capture to capture ladies. So now we have to separate this out and to see how they're actually utilizing these habitat types between these two different seasons. So kind of how do we how do we separate these two seasons out? So we got our growing and non-growing season using net square displacement of deer. Um, and essentially that's just, we captured all of our deer in what we assumed would be, would be their wintering grounds because um, we captured during that winter season about December, February. Um, so when they took that first fix in where they were wintering, how far away they went and stayed is that square displacement. Um, so we found those dates to be roughly April 20th to November 22nd for our growing season, and then non-growing season, December 9th to April 10th. Um, and I also just kind of want to point out that these dates kind of coincided, give or take a couple days, with those major agricultural practices of harvesting. So then we had to de define habitat availability at this population level. So what we did was we have our um, GPS locations of deer on our landscape. And from there, we took a minimum convex polygon of all of our deer locations, no matter individual, we pulled all of these locations together. And then we buffered this 
by the median step length of all of those locations just to kind of um, account for that outside of the GPS movements, um, outside of those GPS locations that we were taking. And from there, we ran a um, simulation to see what the best capture variability of this landscape was going to be, which was a 1 to 10 used available. So for every one deer location, we used 10 random points on the landscape. So we placed our random points and then did an analysis to look at what they're using to what's available. So the landscape variables that we picked that we thought would be um, the most key variables for how these animals are using the landscape was canopy cover as a percent, amplitude of NDVI. So this is basically just taking our minimum value. So NDVI is uh, basically a value of greenness on the landscape. So we're taking that minimum value of where it's bare ground. So if you think about a cornfield in the winter, you're seeing bare ground, and then in the growing season, it's very, very green. So that value of amplitude NDVI would be very high because it's the difference between the lowest and the highest. Distance to roads, distance to water, and then uh, land cover. And then we broke this down into cultivated, so crops and pasture land, uh, grasslands, which are naturally to semi-naturally occurring, and then wetlands, woody and herbaceous wetlands, mostly uh, woody dominating wetlands, and then our other, again, of that forest and developed areas. And we placed the, these in other because they only made up for less than 3% of the land cover types in the area. And then for our model selection, we ran a generalized linear mixed effects model um, using our individual as our random effect. And then hierarchy model selection from there. And then there are AIC to determine what our top model was going to be. So to get into our results, um, we had 18 females during our growing season into our analyses. And then during our non-growing season, we had 21 females. Um, the reason those differ again, deer like to die a lot, so that's why there's two different seasons there, uh, or two different numbers of deer, sorry. So then we move on to our, for our um, growing season, our most valuable characteristic that deer had the high selection for where it was NDVI. Um, and then you can just see through the differences here, this is going to be our growing season on the left and the non-growing season on the right. Um, yeah. So for when we move into this um, non-growing season, we're seeing a shift to wide, a wider range of values, and then as well as a shift upwards um, in the selection of probability of those uh, higher ranging values. And then when we move on to canopy cover, canopy cover was the most influential landscape characteristic during the non-growing season for these animals. Um, and this is pretty, uh, you can see that they have a probability of selection increases by 2% after we hit that harvest and go into this non-growing season. So they're seeking out that uh, cover that they're losing from those, potentially losing from the crops on the landscape. And then distance to water and distance to roads, for distance to water during our growing and non-growing season, they like being closer to water um, for both. Um, and then for our distances to roads, we saw no significant relationship for our growing season. Um, and then during our non-growing season, um, we saw that they're selecting for areas further away from roads. Um, during this growing season, no relationship to water could account for irrigation that's occurring. There might be water throughout the landscape that's easier to find. Um, or I'm sorry, I messed up there. Just forget what I just said. Um, and then for the selecting areas further from roads, this is hunting season. People hunt off roads a lot, um, so they might be looking for areas away from roads um, during this time to kind of get away from those hunting pressures. And then habitat type, um, this again on our left is our growing season, kind of not, not huge differences in the habitats that they're selection selecting for. And then when we move into our non-growing season, we see a two times increase in their selection for woody wetlands. So this might be indicating that they're selecting for that Platte River area um, and they're seeking out forage, potentially more cover in that area due to this harvest that's occurring on the landscape. So again, canopy cover is super important during this uh, non-growing season since it's, it's possible that we're seeing them lose this cover during, um, 
during, this grow during the non-growing season from harvest. And then uh, the selection for median values could be showing that these animals are still targeting more naturally occurring areas because um, they like forbs on, uh, forbs on the ground. Those are higher, high nutritional content for them. So these natural areas might still be something that they're seeking out no matter the season for those median values. Um, and then th again, that understory vegetation is still important to them even though they might, even though there's ample crops and other forage on this landscape. So to tie this all back, um, to kind of put together these two chapters and really look at the question of how are these animals responding to this drastic alteration that's occurring on the landscape between our harvest and planting uh, seasons. So conclusions coming from both of these are the potential high risk areas of disease transmission. We can kind of key in on those areas um, like we spoke briefly about density dependence. If we're seeing these estimations of deer going higher in these more naturally occurring areas, these could be the targeted areas of where we might see if there's an outbreak to occur. It could wipe through pretty quickly if these animals are densely um, compacted into this one small area. And then um, reduction in forage availability. Again, they're moving into these more naturally occurring habitats during their winter time. Reducing cover again, looking for, this is all kind of pointing to, they're looking for those more naturally occurring areas. So natural occurring areas are kind of important to them still, even, even in the growing and not growing season, but more importantly during that kind of crunch time of not growing and that winter time. So kind of uh, what we thought for management types would be to kind of manage for those more naturally occurring habitat types. So trying to keep them out of land conversion into agriculture. So animals are moving into these non, uh, moving into these more semi-naturally occurring habitat types. So it's important to keep them there and uh, not reduce them to just one small patch and make those density dependent, density dependent issues even larger for one area. And um, again, the, these high deer densities, we could be seeing overgrazing problems, so changing those plant communities. And then uh, the big, big one is, again, the disease transmission. Higher numbers of deer in these areas, if an outbreak were to occur, we can see this spread pretty quickly throughout the population if they're condensed into smaller patches. And to continue sampling in these areas to maybe see if an outbreak could occur um, is one of the big things that Gavin Parks is doing, but the continuation of these sampling tests, testing in these areas of where we think these high density estimates is vital. Um, so I kind of just wanted to go over my capture numbers to just kind of add to the story of how what's happening to these animals. Um, so the total deer that we captured was 63. Um, this is including adults, yearlings, and fawns. So we caught 38 total females, and we see a very high, um, high number on the yearlings and fawns. So within that first year of life, kind of going into that second year of life, and a little bit less on those older animals. So we could see something potentially going on that they're not making it past, um, past maybe two plus, three plus. And then for the males, we caught 25, and they were fairly, um, fairly uh, the same throughout, 7, 8, and 10. And then we had, uh, I just wanted to go through our adult mortalities because we have a lot of deer die for unknown reasons. Um, so our females, we had 26 total adult females, so this drops because I got rid of fawns. Um, and we don't know the fate of the fawns because we didn't collar any of them. But two were to do to hunter harvest, and then we had six unknown deaths that we couldn't, um, either the carcass was too far gone that we couldn't uh, get an idea of what happened, or samplings kind of came up, un un uh, nothing came up with sampling. Then we had one die from lymphoma, which is basically severe lesions in the brain, and they start to uh, kind of act a little weird. Um, and then GPS failures, we had three collar failures, so we don't know the fate of those animals. Um, and then males, unfortunately we don't really know what's going on with the males because we had 12 GPS failures, so we're not sure what the fate of those animals are. Uh, but we did get two in hunter harvest and then one that did die, uh, which was unknown causes of why he died specifically. So for future research, um, to investigate habitat selection at the third order, so this is going more for what they're using within their home ranges rather than the population. Um, and then male selection, we were unable to do male selection due to that amount of GPS failures. 
so to throw that in to see how the males are reacting to these um, changes. And then migration, dispersal, survival, recruitment. I think survival is a big one because uh, we did have a lot die uh, and to see what's actually going on. Maybe there's an underlying issue that we're not we're not seeing yet. So um, how they're migrating throughout, dispersing is big, big pictures next to look at through fine scale data of GPS collar animals. So um, I just like to thank all of my deer that <laughs> decided to wander underneath my net and walk by my camera. Without them, I would have no data points. So they were super helpful. Um, Mick, who's in the room right now, raise your hand. Without him, I don't think that I would have caught all of my deer. And this is him and me releasing our very last captured animal. Um, I weigh a lot less than him, so it probably should have went the other way around, but that was a very high note in the project. So with that, I will take any questions. Yeah, I mean, that's definitely something 
we could do, but we didn't, we didn't specifically look at that. We just did this estimation off the point counts of you know, what we were seeing in front of the camera, essentially. <coughs> Can I tell from your map that you showed, instead of your map you showed, that this looks like it stands basically from Kearney to Odessa, or yeah. how about how big your study area, I guess, is my question. Uh, about 280 square kilometers. Okay, and largely between Kearney and Odessa? Yeah, it, so it extended okay. from um, basically the I-80 to kind of following Kearney and then from WRP, okay. essentially. publication of your habitat selection, assuming that what's, a, what's down at Funk is available to adhere at Kearney? I mean, they, they move, I mean, that's only from from here to here, if you count the sections, I think it's only about 13 miles, and like, and previous literature that's done migration on white-tailed deer, they'll, they'll move 14 plus miles, so you could say from other literature, this is available to them just because of those other migration distances they do have in some areas. So, Miranda, kind of build off of that. So, when you're doing second order selection, you're, you're, not, you're not assuming that that animal can be down there at the same time. But it is up here. So, what I think she is going to do is third order selection, which that, because second order is basically looking at the population scale. Second order will then hone in on the actual individual home range size of that individual, and that's you put available as a function of that scale. So it changes the scale a little bit, but that is a good question kind of thinking about, you know, is that area truly available to that individual? So, yeah. I, I, I guess this largely is topic discussion stems from the fact that I have 15 years of research at DeSoto, which is a much smaller area than this, the Soto National Wildlife Refuge. And running into publication issues just because what you, what I find to be available, and I, I use a one kilometer, one square kilometer area. Yeah. I'm still running into problem publishing some of that work based on 15 years of yeah. data and thousands of beers. So it's yeah. just something to be aware of and think about, I guess, going forward. Well, yeah. there's also a lot of work right now on uh, using like things like step selection functions, which are another way to get around that. So you're defining or you're constraining the availability within a certain range. You can also do discrete choice analyses, which basically define like a buffer around uh, used points. And then you can, so if you have VHF data, I don't know what kind of data you have, but you can actually define that and say, you know, mean this daily distance of a deer is X, and then that's your buffer around that used point, and you generate randoms within that. And then you say essentially, you know, why did the animal choose this point and not A, B, and C, or whatever, however many randoms. So that may be a way, I know, that may be a way to handle that for your data set. Yep. So. Yep, I think just the uh, scatter across the entire study, you're like, I just think you're going to run into problems. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, for that second order, we are kind of constraining. So we didn't catch any deer down here. So we are kind of constraining to this area when we're looking at use available within uh -huh. that area. So I guess technically this could be available to them. But the deer that we caught, it was kind of only in that northern edge that they were using. talking the other day, you had a, some site fidelity on some fawning grounds. Mm -hmm. was, was there a site fidelity as far as fields during growing season that these does would go? And yep. They're pretty much using the same fields over and over. Yep. Yeah, so um, they really, so when I was saying they increase movement, they really restrict their movement during that growing season. But they pretty much just use kind of, they'll stick within kind of a patch almost of where there's a little bit of forested cover, and then they'll just utilize like the edges of fields or four fields around that area and they don't really move off of that at all um, so they and they go back to those areas so those deer that were shifting were going back to that same spot yeah uh, would, you, would you expect the difference uh, let's say daytime versus nighttime 
habitat selection or crepuscular timing selection versus outside that timing? Um, yeah, so we actually, uh, for the density stuff specifically, we did a peak activity data set, so which was a subset of our 24 hour, um, and there weren't really that big of a difference in the density estimates that we were getting when we used that subset in our 24 hour period. We did not look at the GPS data for differences between that um, activity of night day, but that's something also to look at, because um, I would suspect that they'd be using the fields probably at night and then moving in for the non-grown season specifically for moving out at night and then coming back in during the day for resting periods. So that's something actually to look at. It should be a simple one. I'm just okay. curious about, um, you did a random site selection for your cameras. I'm curious what the difference would have been if you did a more grid-based camera trap system. Um, so the reason, I mean, we wanted to do random sites and then to kind of go off of that, we kind of um, selected for areas not within the cornfield because there would be super obstruction. So the grid, I don't know how well that would work for placing the cameras um, just because of the obstruction but there might be, we might see some differences if we have, again, as I mentioned, more cameras. So maybe doing grids in the areas that we are allowed might give us a better density estimate. So yeah, that might help. Thank you.